The Face in the Frost by Jean Belair's Two. When Roger Bacon woke up the next morning, or rather the next noon, he felt something more than usually muggy. He felt something more than the usual muggy heat of August days in the South Kingdom. He felt tension in the air, a tension almost audible, a humming of a high-pitched string. He was inclined to blame this feeling on his own nervous nature, so he took a leisurely bath and started down the hall toward the staircase. Prospero's door was open, but he was not in bed. There was no sound downstairs. Roger tiptoed quietly down the steps, went to the living room, and took a square-headed iron mace down from its hook on the wall. But when he stepped into the hallway, there was Prospero, standing at the front door, holding the linen, linen curtain aside and peering out of the small square window. Without turning, Prospero spoke. Put that silly weapon away and go to the kitchen. There's some bread and marmalade, and I've made some coffee. And we're surrounded. Roger dropped the mace, which just missed his toe as it fell. Surrounded? By whom? By whomever or whatever our friend with the book has decided to send against us. Look. Roger pressed his face against the small square window across the road. Under a tall hedge thorn stood three gray figures. Roger laughed. Surrounded by those three. Oh, there are more. There are at least ten more in the forest the east of us, and I think there are some waiting up the road toward Breakspear. Anyway, numbers don't mean anything. These things are agents of what... These things are the agents and the work of a man who probably has more power than we have. He is learning how to use that book, and when he has enough strength, or thinks he has, they will close in. Roger pounded the door in frustration. Then why are we having breakfast? Are we going to die gracefully at the table like gentlemen? Why don't you try something? Between the two of us, we ought to be able to send them back to what's-his-name with their blasted gray robes on fire. <clears throat> and what if we can't? Then he'll know what we can do. Right now, I don't think he's sure. He wouldn't have sent them if he didn't think that I am some kind of threat to him, although right now I would love to know just how I could disturb him. Prospero glanced out the window again and continued... Even if we do drive them off, we still have him to deal with. I will bet you, Roger, that those things can't do anything until nightfall, so there is certainly time for breakfast. Roger kicked the iron mace into the corner and followed Prospero to the kitchen, where they ate a big breakfast of ham, scrambled eggs, bread, and quince marmalade. Prospero seemed amused by Roger's nervousness, and this made the latter more and more cranky. Now, said Prospero, pushing back his chair, you are probably wondering what we are going to do. Come on. He got up and went to the cellar door. Are we going to hide? Said Roger. Oh, good. It's been years since I hid in a nice smelly basement. Prospero was laughing so hard that he had trouble getting down the stairs. He led Roger to a high rampart of cordwood, which he then began to dismantle. Oh, I see, said Roger as he helped him. We're going to burn the house down. That ought to throw them off. When the wood was cleared away, the two wizards were standing before a black door with porcelain goose egg, with a porcelain goose egg knob. A yellowed piece of cardboard held the door with a red th held the door with a red thumbtack said, "Root cellar." Well, I haven't been in this place for several months," said Prospero. "There's no telling what we'll find." He pushed the door open, and a rank Swedish smell of decaying vegetables hit them. In the windowless earth-floored room were shelves into which blackened rubber rutabagas were rotting. Mason jars filled with cloudy green dandelion wine and bushel, and bushel baskets of wildly sprouting potatoes. Here and there, the walls were blotched with white and green fungus. In a corner, cheesy green spotted, toads, spotted toadstools were squatting. Prospero calmly began to take the jars off the shelves that lined the short wall opposite the door. Then he started to lift the shelves from their curlicued iron brackets. Roger was watching him now with delight, for under the dirt and vegetable growth on the wall was the outline of a small arched door. Prospero, you never told me about this. I always meant to, but it seemed, but it never seemed all that important. I began to build it quite a few years ago, but I ran into a little trouble. You'll see what I mean. The door, at any rate, is a success. It responds to one of the oldest door spells in the world. He placed his hands on the door and whispered, a few raspy words that sounded like Arabic. Actually, they were corrupt Coptic. The door swung inward with a loud screech, and Prospero, ducking his head, stepped inside and motioned for Roger to follow him. A low-ceiling dirt tunnel 
filled with basalt slabs for steps went spiraling down to a smooth stone floor. At the bottom of the stairs, Roger looked at the long vaulted tunnel before him. I knew it, he said. Gothic arches and little carved monster heads. You would. Of course, said Prospero, picking up a small tin lantern that hung near the stairs. Notice the fan vaulting and follow me. They walked through a tunnel that sloped gently down and took one sharp right angle turn. Suddenly the tunnel opened into a natural cave, a dome stalactite dripping room with a dark cold stream flowing through it. Here, said Prospero, is our problem. I ran into this and had to stop. There's no stone beyond this point, and the earth behind that wall is very mushy, but the tunnel that the steam flows through rises four feet above the level of the water. Roger was getting nervous again. Are we going to crawl through the water? Do you know where the stream goes? Prospero smiled. I have it on the authority of a talking fish that this stream runs underground for 10 miles and then empties into a small lake in the realm of our friend King Gorm. You remember him. Well, I think he has a library like the one in Roundcourt, though not so complete. I've never seen it, but it ought to have a copy of the register, and I want to look up the crest on that book plate. It's a start anyway, and there's a possibility that the owner of such an ugly device might have gotten the book back. And I want to know more about that kindly old fisherman who suddenly volunteered to drown the book for the monk. If the lake isn't, step, isn't stocked with gray ghastlies, we may find something interesting, he looked at Roger, who then who was still scowling at him. Oh, yes, no, we're not going to crawl. Come upstairs. Back in the living room, Prospero went to the mantelpiece and took down a small, very accurate-looking ship model. This, he said, is what we are going in, the British man-of-war Acteon, which ran, will run, around, will run aground on a sandbar during the siege of, of Charleston in 1776. Do you know, by the way, that Lord Nelson was hit in the head with a cannonball at the Battle of the Nile? You pick up the damnedest things from that mirror. Roger looked pained. I think, he said, that I'll go get a glass of hard cider. Upstairs later, Roger was in Prospero's room, helping him pack into a green plush carpet bag such essentials as tarot cards, extra tobacco, and pocket magic books. The magic mirror, after plaguing the two men with questions, was finally beginning to understand what was going on. You mean, it said, in a scarcely, with a scarcely surprised giggle, that you're going to make yourselves smaller? Yes, said Prospero, what of it? The mirror broke into hysterical cackles and began to chant in a falsetto voice. Magic words of poof, poof, piffles. Make me just as small as sniffles. Woo, hoo, hoo. He, he, he. I'll wager, said Prospero, that I have the only mirror that wallows in the trash of future centuries. Roger was nervously opening and shutting the casement window. I'm worried, he said. What do you suppose he'll do when he finds out we've gone? Will he destroy your house or go down the road and attack the village? I think he will try to find us. He hasn't reached his full strength yet by any means. That is, if the book is as evil as I think it is, and I don't think he'll waste any powers destroying a village or a house out of anger. It has occurred to me that he may not be able to injure my house anyway. The hearthstone was laid by Michael Scott, my teacher, and it has many powerful spells on it. He built a good deal of the house, too, and there are still things about it I don't understand. Why, there's a cupboard that's... Oh, the devil! Some other time, I guess. I've got everything. Goodbye, Mirror. I trust you can entertain yourself while we're gone. I should hope so. I think I'll scare the wits out of the cleaning lady when she comes. I have a very nice scream... A little later, downstairs, Prospero wrote a note in black crayon and left it on the kitchen table under a bust of Emperor Papinius. Dear Mrs. Dunfree, we will be gone. For, we'll be gone for an indefinite period. Pay no attention to the mirror if it acts up, and in any and in any case, you know where the harp case is. You can slip it over him when he's not looking. Don't forget to water the training arbutus and the creeping Charlie. Change the water in the large onyx water clock. The other one takes care of itself. Help yourself to the cheese and anything else. The Cheshire goes dry and crusty if you don't eat it. With luck, I should be back for the big Christmas party. Say hello to his lordship the mayor for me. 
Prospero. P.S. Unexplained noises are best left unexplained. He looked around the house sadly. I do hate to leave. Oh, well. Are the windows closed, Roger? Grab your bag and let's get going. Soon the secret door had closed behind the two wizards, and they had placed the boat in the black water where it rocked gently, moored by a pair of wispy cords. The ship was close to the low bank, and a rope ladder hung down from the muddy edge on the port side rail. Roger Bacon and Prospero stood looking doubtfully at the tiny craft. Well, said Roger, I don't suppose we can put it off. No, said Prospero, I don't suppose we can. He thumbed a small book, which looked like a pocket dictionary, until he found the page he wanted. All together now, shrivel, shrink, squinch, and swivel, dwindle, dwilp, melt, and dribble. Zalamea Alcazar! Roger and Prospero shrank and shrank until they looked like two odd chess pieces standing by the brown slopping sides of the boat. They made faces at each other, laughed a little, and then climbed aboard. And we'll pause there.